Um, welcome everybody to Herpless Data in Manchester, although we are now in the virtual world. Um, just some general guidance for tonight. Uh, please remember to be kind both to yourself and others. As Natalie just said before I press record, this is day 500 and something of March and you know the ongoing COVID pandemic. So um, just remember to, to be kind to yourself. And if you need to leave for whatever reason, um, please feel empowered to do so. This meeting is being recorded so you can always catch up on it later. Um, and with that said, if you don't want your face in the video, um, you can turn off your, your video, um, but otherwise the, it is helpful for the speakers and for participants um, to see you um, and respond to the, to the talks and give feedback in that way. So uh, feel empowered to either keep your video on or off. Please keep yourself muted when not speaking to minimize background noise. Um, do feel free to engage and ask questions in the chat and you can also private message me um, via the Zoom chat uh, with any questions or issues. And please do not share the Zoom room link publicly, and this is just to avoid anybody sabotaging the meeting. We do have a code of conduct. It's, um, you can read it in full on our website, but in short, we don't tolerate harassment of any kind. So if you do need to report any misconduct, um, you can either contact me via the Zoom chat privately, or you can email us at herplusdatamcr at gmail.com. So uh, here at Herpless Data Manchester, our mission is to bring together women with a connection to data to provide a safe space where we can support and celebrate each other, share experiences and knowledge, establish meaningful connections and talk data. Um, I'm one of your organizers, I'm Rachel Ainsworth. I'm at the base of the University of Manchester. Mona uh, is also here on the call and she's a product manager at Booking.com. And uh, Bernadette uh, is uh, at Evolution Recruitment Solutions and she's hugely supportive of our events, but she couldn't make it tonight. Um, but feel free to contact any of us um, with any questions or comments, um, we'd love to engage. So this is our third birthday. So I'll just run through a few um, photos. We've been meeting since September 2017 and our community has grown and we really enjoy um, both meeting with you in person and here online. So thank you so much for continuing to engage in this space. We hope that you find it useful and meaningful and um, enjoy it. Um, we have steadily grown since we started, although because of the pandemic and um, because we opened up some of our events as well, um, our membership has sort of plateaued, but we're still very, very happy to have you all here in our community. Um, it is your community and, and we wouldn't be here without you and your engagement. We've had lots of absolutely incredible speakers over the years, so I just want to acknowledge and thank everyone um, individually for sharing their time and their stories with us um, because it really helps us grow as a community and, and help um, inspire others. Um, so if you ever want to give a talk here at Her Plus Data, maybe you can be added to this list for our next birthday. Our events are the second Thursday of each month, so um, it makes it easy to save the date. So our next event is Thursday, October 8th, same time, same place. Um, and we'll have a focus um, of talks on NHS and health data. Um, we're also open to an actively seeking collaboration on events and adding more events to our normal meetup schedule. So if you do want to either um, speak in an event, suggest a speaker, suggest a theme or a topic or collaborate on an event, we'd really love to hear from you. You can connect with us on Meetup, Twitter. We have a YouTube channel where you can catch up on the recordings. We have a Slack channel and you can email us. So there's lots of different ways to connect. Um, just a huge thank you to Evolution Recruitment Solutions um, and Bernadette in particular, who has um, been supporting our group and our events. And thank you to the Software Sustainability Institute for covering the cost of our Meetup page. Although Anna is on the call and she's speaking tonight and she funded the costs of our Meetup page um, the first couple of years, so a huge thank you to Anna as well. But tonight we have an absolutely incredible lineup of speakers. I'm so excited. Um, we've got Annette Joseph, the founder of Diverse and Equal Tech, who will speak first. Then we have Natalie Jameson, founder of The Hero Works, who will speak second. We have Professor Anna Scaife of the University of Manchester, who will speak third. And then we have Marina Tuscumano, uh, an NLP data science intern at Hello Service. We're really excited to hear the career journeys um, and data projects from these in, in really inspiring women in data. Um, just a quick announcement tonight. Um, we like to uh, continue the visibility of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we are so grateful to Annette for coming tonight to speak to us more in depth about this. Um, but just a reminder that there's a GoFundMe page to help fund um, initiatives 
um, to make sure that Black voices are heard and represented at every level of the tech industry. So we'll be hearing more about this from Annette in a few minutes. Um, but just very quickly, my favorite, not my favorite moment of the meetup, but um, I would love to get a quick group photo if that's all right with everybody. So if you would like to be in the group photo, now is the time to share your video. Um, and I will just prepare for this. So if everybody is ready, I'll do a quick countdown. In three, two, one. I bet you heard my cat meowing just as I did that. Excellent. Um, and without further ado, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everybody for coming. Again, if you have any questions or want to engage at all, please feel free to use the chat. And um, yeah, uh, Annette, would you like to share your screen? And I think you're muted still. There we go. Can everybody see okay. that? Yes. Yes, excellent. So hi, uh, my name is Annette Joseph. I'm the founder of Diverse and Equal. Um, we started about two and a half years ago with the aim of increasing diversity in tech in the Northwest. So over the past um, few months specifically, our vision has increased, grown a little bit. Um, and now it's to use tech as a vehicle to create a fair society for everyone by equipping people with, from underserved um, backgrounds with the skills to fulfill crucial roles while empowering organizations to embed cultures that embrace and celebrate that difference. So um, I'm going to speak mainly today about um, the gap in knowledge and data around the black experience in Britain. So during the week of um, George Floyd's death, I'd been really busy. Um, I'd seen bits and pieces all on social media about what was happening, um, but for my own mental health and for a really long time, I think since a long time, <laughs> a couple of decades actually, I, I, I limit my um, news intake just to kind of take care of myself because I take it in. Um, but that Saturday morning, I remember getting up thinking, woof, got no work to do today, coming downstairs, opening Twitter and being barraged with video after video of black bodies being brutalized. Um, it was, I didn't watch the video itself, but I did see how the protesters were being treated, how they were being tear gassed, um, run over by police cars. And the next thing I knew, I was on the kitchen floor, curled up in a ball, sobbing. Um, I didn't understand my reaction. I didn't understand how 4,000 miles away, happening to people that I didn't know, how it felt so close and so personal. Um, so over the coming days, um, the feeling of grief became stronger and stronger and more palpable and I decided to try to get to the bottom of it and I asked myself why and sat down with a piece of paper and that article that I wrote um, which we can share another time is I don't know if you've read it but it just poured out um, and after I read it I got a little bit afraid to be honest um, I was expecting pushback I don't know if any of you follow on Twitter, people like Afua Hirsch or David Lamy. But if you do, you'll know that as soon as they say anything at all that's pro-black, the trolls come out. Um, so what I did, I kind of preempted that pushback and I trolled through the internet to find resources to evidence all of the points that I raised. And then terrified, fingers crossed, push publish, um, and then just kind of waited to see what would happen. Um, the article got 24,000 views and um, I've been contacted by black people in the UK and abroad, black and brown people, but black people specifically in the UK and abroad, thanking me for voicing their pain and their frustration. I've been contacted by white people saying how helpful the article has been in helping them understand something that had been invisible to them. Um, and the feedback has been valuable because it confirmed to me that it was heard and that people actually received it in the spirit that it was given. 
and for that I'm really grateful. So today what we're going to do is talk about the gap between our mainstream narrative of the black experience and the knowledge and data available and um, that's available and missing and about the actual experiences um, because I don't think anybody had written an article about that before and it's great that the movement has happened and as a result of George Floyd's death that this this uh, dialogue is now open um, so we're going to explore how that gap is actually hurting us and discuss what we can do about it so quiz time um, so there are six events on this slide has anyone heard of any one of these things any of these things so if you've however many things you've heard of if you can just put the number in the chat um, so that we can see Yeah. Ooh. So I'm not, so we've got quite a few zeros, a couple of twos, a couple of ones, threes, there's a four, that's the, that's the biggest one. Um, yeah, that's about standard. I'm not going to go into them right now because we don't have time, but these are things that are in the article. Um, there's more details about these in the article that I wrote. Um, and have you heard of any of these people? So, um, Sir Larry Constantine, um, Mary Seacole, Lillian Bader, or John Edmonston? So, I'll just tell you quickly about one of them. So, John Edmonston, um, which is the illustration at the bottom. He was a black enslaved man that was born in um, Demerara, British Guyana, who ended up teaching taxidermy to students at the University of Edinburgh, including Charles Darwin. And Charles Darwin actually credits uh, John Edmiston in some of his writings for actually teaching him. And then moving closer to home and, and more recent, so there's eight people on this slide. Um, have you heard of any of them? So first one, Dr. Anne-Maria Maffedon, um, MBE, Stephen Bartlett, Margaret Busby, OBE, Mike Little. Uh, Mike Little is actually one of Manchester's own. Um, he is, he's from Manchester and he actually created WordPress. Um, Oswald Boateng, Chiching Wanaku, and Dr. Mark Richards. Have you heard of any of those people? One. Okay. Um, yeah, all of these people and events are British history. Um, and most people, most British people, including black British people, know nothing about them and we don't know anything about the people, we don't know anything about the events, um, and that's because they don't feature in our national narrative. They aren't mentioned in our media, and although it's slightly better now than it was 10 years ago, mostly when black people see ourselves represented in connection with something in the media, it's something negative. Um, these people, these events aren't mentioned in our education system either. The only thing we learn about black people in schools is that we were slaves. Um, and while I support the call to have black history taught in schools, how about we start with teaching all of British history and tell complete stories, not just the bits that we like the most. This lack of knowledge is actually hurting us. It's one of the key reasons that there's such a divide in our society, um, such disparity because we're all um, going off an assumption that is just not true. And it's 2020 and ignorance is no longer acceptable. So as people who work in tech and data, it's our responsibility to ensure that full stories are told and that everyone's experiences are, are being included and everyone's needs are being considered. So when whole communities are underrepresented or missing, this tells us a lot too and how, and how we're doing things and who we're excluding. So this quote, I was in a meeting earlier this week 
talking about data. And uh, Gemma said the data we don't have is just as important as the data we do because it tells us a lot. Um, how do we know this? How do we, how do we know um, how to do this when we often don't know what we're missing? How do we uncover our unknown unknowns? And so this is where the many benefits of full spectrum customer centric research and diverse teams come into play, both of which in our region is pretty hard to come by. The number of people from diverse backgrounds who work in tech is pretty low, which oftentimes means that these diverse groups are also missing from research as the team hasn't considered them. We also have huge gaps in data around how tech is impacting the lives of underserved communities. And that's where the Black Tech GoFundMe comes in. So a couple of days after the article was published um, and it started to literally go everywhere, um, we launched a Black Tech GoFundMe to look specifically at the impact of uh, tech on Black people and Black communities. So as well as the gap in knowledge and education, the data around Black people's progression um, around their experiences in the workplace is really slim even just data on how many black people are in the, in the workplace is slim. We just, we just cannot get accurate data. Um, but we have data around gender and we have that data has been quite instrumental in beginning to, or at least having a conversation around closing the pay gap and progression. And so we should be monitoring race too. Um, so um, we held a user research taster session in August and off the back of that we've recruited three amazing young people to I say young but yeah people <laughs> grown people I say that because I'm old <laughs> we've recruited three amazing people to train with us while we're actually conducting this research um, we're kicking that off next Tuesday um, which is, the, and the first bit of research that we're going to do is around barriers to entry for black people in tech. So we'll be speaking to people who have, who have qualified and yet are unable to find work in the sector or, um, and also black adults who are looking to change career who haven't really considered tech because it's outside of their sphere. So we've got really big ambitions for this research and we really need your help to spread the word. So some of the th other things that we've got upcoming are um, we've got coding taster sessions, which are paid for by the Black Tech Fund. We've got a series coming up um, that's been led by a group of engineers. So it's looking at all the, instead of coding being this uh, amalgamous thing, we're kind of breaking down some of the different disciplines within coding. So we're looking at HTML, CSS on one, JavaScript and the other, accessibility, testing, um, Python, there's one other one that I can't remember. Um, so that's going to be a series and it starts on the 29th of September and it runs every two weeks. Um, and then we are doing a data science taster, um, which is really exciting because we've never done anything with data science before. Um, and one of the things that we're actually looking for with that is mentors and help to help to run the session. We've got a scholarship with, we've got um, licenses with uh, Data Camp, um, and so we'll be using that platform, but the mentors to help to uh, foster the right environment of support and um, comfort amongst the people who come to the um, sessions is really key. So if anybody's interested in signing up to be a mentor, that would be really appreciated. And then uh, next year we'll be running a Data science boot camps and we'll also be running agile immersion sessions which train user researchers, service designers and delivery managers as well. And that's it from me. Thank you. And I unmute to clap. Thank you. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing and I was trying to, to tweet all of the links at the same time. So apologies. Um, yeah, no, thank you so much for, for sharing all of that. And um, yeah, I definitely read your, your blog post when, when you submitted it and it, it's really, really powerful. And I encourage everybody to read it if they haven't already. I've linked it in the chat and I can link to it again. Um, but does anybody have any questions um, for Annette? Feel free to raise your hand or unmute yourself. Can I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, amazing. Um, I'm 
I kind of thought I knew what you did, but I actually didn't know what you did, not properly. I had no idea the um, evidence-based approach that you were taking. You absolutely blow me away there. And I'm sorry to say, um, coming, you know, I'm half black and I didn't know half of that, which species that we don't get taught our own history. And it, it, there, that is damaging. And yeah, for me, um, I absolutely, well, I want to support you on this. So there's some, some stuff I think I can tap you into on the data science mentors I know some incredible AI and data science um, deep researchers, but um, yeah, um, yeah, we can we can talk after this. But fantastic, great work. Thank you. I guess I'll ask a quick question while people are um, still thinking if they have any others. Um, so, as far as the the taster sessions in boot camps that you're looking um, for help for, um, in particular with mentorship. Do you have any, um, I think I think you mentioned some skills that you were looking for, um, but do you have any maybe words of encouragement for people who might hesitate to volunteer as a mentor or um, think that they might not necessarily have the skills or the expertise or experience to be a mentor? Um, do you have any? So the, the taster sessions that we run um, we actually got shortlisted for a national award for them because of the way that they're run. Um, so they are for people who know nothing about any of the roles because that's part of the problem. Um, one of the reasons why we can't hire diverse people in tech is because they don't know what the roles mean. So this is basically the basic of most basic training it's big, it, we get them into an environment that is really friendly, really open, um, really supportive, get them nice and relaxed, um, and then teach them the basics of the role and allow them to, to have some hands-on experience of it. So when we were doing it face-to-face, -face, it was a three-hour session, two hours of that is full hands-on because the goal of the session is for people to leave knowing oh, I actually like that. I'm going to find out more about doing this. Oh, yeah, that's not for me. Um, and that is the only goal of the session. And, and one of the things that we try to do is um, one instructor for every four people so that there's lots of support and also to get mentors and instructors and facilitators from all walks of life. So as, as diverse as we possibly can in the mentors so that people can see themselves represented because when you walk into a room and there are people in there that look like you have the same experiences as you you're automatically that little bit more relaxed you feel a lot safer and you feel like people are actually gonna cater to you and speak your language so you know it doesn't matter if you think that you know you don't have enough experience if you're working in data then you've got enough experience. If you could just explain what the role is to them, like the help is just really basic at this point in the taster sessions. Mm. So all help would be amazing. Yeah. Okay. I, I'd like to mentor as well. Put myself down. <laughs> cool. I'll put my um, email in the chat. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, you can just send me an email and make sure I did it right. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. So you can just send me an email if you're interested in being a mentor. Um, Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Any other um, questions for Annette? Well, thank you so much again um, for sharing that. And I've linked. Um, pretty much everything um, to Diverse and Equal, the GoFundMe page, the blog post, um, and the Twitter accounts. Uh, so you can uh, click on those to learn more. But let's give Annette another huge round of applause. Thank you so much for coming to talk to us about your initiatives. I'm really looking forward to, to reading the research that comes out of it and, and actually having that data, because you're right, it's just, it just doesn't exist. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. As well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I'd gone before you. <laughs>
I feel completely moved after that. <laughs> I'm gonna say you're up next, Natalie. I know like what a hard, oh, what a hard act to follow, but uh, amazing. Um, so um, continue. I think this should work. That was me. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> I want to um, just, I guess, start off by telling you a little bit about uh, about me. And uh, I um, I was born to um, Wendy um, Williams and Nathaniel Williams. And my mom was a typical British English rose. And uh, my dad was one of the first um, Black American pilots in the American Air Force. So they were both very quite rebellious. And um, we spent um, my childhood uh, moving every two or three years and we moved all over the world, um, uh, which meant that I got a real, um, I guess, um, global citizen view in the way um, I saw the world. And also being a child of a, you know, a, a, a soldier, um, and an Air Force soldier, um, you kind of grow up with this um, unwavering sense of, of duty as well. So the whole culture is around, um, you know, you see a problem, it doesn't matter where it is in the world, um, you have a sense and a responsibility to sort it out. And, you know, that's what my, my dad did. And we, we spent uh, my childhood doing that. And, and that's really formed my whole, I guess, um, sort of approach to my work and my career and everything. So if I see a problem, I want to go and sort it out. Um, so I am Nestle and I'm the founder of, um, I'll say I have a toddler and a newborn, which I would say the Hero Works is my toddler. We've been um, going for um, just under a year and a half and um, Citizen AI, which is brand new. And um, I'll tell you a little bit more about those, but um, I want to start off by sharing a bit of a, um, oh, hang on, I can, yeah, it's going, <laughs> going. Um, so that one there in the air is my daughter and she's um, 12 years old. She just turned 12 and uh, her name's Darcy. And uh, she has already got her whole um, life plan sorted out and she has done since she's been, been about sort of six, seven years old. And um, she wants to be with the Royal National Ballet. And when she says she's too old for that, she wants to be a human rights lawyer. And um, her dad, my husband, um, he's, um, he's from Newcastle in, uh, you know, up, up north. And um, obviously he's not racist and in any way, shape or form or sexist. Um, but part of this overhearing a conversation that they both had um, really helped to frame what I think we're facing in terms of um, bias in tech. So the conversation went a little bit like this. So, um, you know, it was after the Me Too movement and then um, obviously we had the Black Lives Matter movement. And he made a comment which was, all lives matter and i i i was in the it was in the back in the background i wasn't even you know involved in this conversation and um he made this comment and my little girl and this was literally only uh, you know a few weeks ago um said to him okay dad can i can i explain the concept to you of of equity and uh, he was like well, yeah no i understand what equity is she goes, well, what you're talking about is equality. But she said, what if you had 200 pounds and you gave one to one person, but that person was already 200 pounds overdrawn and you gave the same amount to the other person? That is what equity is. She said, it doesn't, treating everybody the same is not good enough. It's not going to get us to the place where we have equity. And that in itself made me think, wow, what an insightful comment from um, a 12 year old. And it started, it started me thinking, you know, what is, it, what is it that needs to happen that we need to do to bring equity? Um, so I have had a varied, you know, interdisciplinary career. Um, and when the, um, the George 
um oh gosh you know um when that incident kicked off it's similar to Annette I had a different um I had a different similar deep but different reaction and I started thinking about um the situation not just in in America but I'm dual national I have a you know two passports but it started thinking about um you know Martin Luther King and how far we haven't come and in part of his speech um he says that America has given black people a bad check and a check which has come back marked insufficient funds and I was like well actually yeah that check is bouncing all over the world it's bouncing here but the difference here is it's it's more covert and part of the issue and this is where you know I was listening to, to Annette thinking that that is literally about the data the data is not there we have no way the only way to measure it and like you said she said about the um, women um, pay gap and looking at um, the stats around that that's getting measured and now that is getting dealt with so I started looking at where this was becoming an issue um, and where we didn't have where we didn't have data and there were big problems and over the past sort of few years I have managed to um, save a little bit of pot of money and my reaction to the Black Lives Matter was to take action and I thought I want to do something but I want to do something in terms of um, addressing an issue with a product so i started looking at if there if i was going to develop an ai product or a data science based product what would it be what would the biggest thing that i would want to spend my time developing and i started thinking about homelessness and bad housing and in terms of um race and particularly um black households we are the most overrepresented in all of those statistics and the highest raising highest um, rising group as well in um, homelessness and bad housing um, if you take the afro-caribbean community again they are also the highest rising homelessness group and there's no there's no data there to, that explains why that is, and you know this there's there's been research there's lots of research that says that this structural and systemic bias is there, but there's no way of actually identifying what is happening. Are we not getting opportunities to be housed? Um, are we not? Uh, are we going into the system and then not being able to sustain tenancies because of other reasons? Or whatever and they're really um, at the moment particularly after COVID we have this oh, I go place. Um, we have after after COVID this situation has has become dire to the point of it's not just about being homeless it's actually affecting people's infection rates and um you know the, the the death and infection rates in black people are um again overrepresented and i think this is part of to do with the housing so i thought okay what can i do i wanted to create something with the rush towards digital and you know the government have some very um i guess um ambitious targets around um going digital by default and this has exasperated the issue um covid with you know they closed all of the um citizens advice um face-to-face -face, you know offices you can't go in there anymore and everybody's like if it's on the web oh, it's on the website the all the information you need is on the website but if you um are either you have some um, literacy issues or you don't have um, any access to tech. So, so for instance, in the lockdown, we had 
um, 2,000 children in Salford alone who had no access to Wi-Fi and no access to any hardware either. So if you don't have this ability to go online, then you're not going to be able to access either the housing or the um, or the information or the you know the advice to be able to deal with that. So that's where I started thinking about um, people with protected characteristics, and you know, in particular, black people, and um, and also at the intersection of gender as well. Um, because again, um, women are rising on the homelessness numbers as well. And also um, disability um, is another um, factor as well. Only 1% of the housing, um, the housing stock in the UK is fit for um, disabled people and they're not making these houses um, accessible again. So, this was the area that I really wanted to um, focus on. So I think that technology can be both the problem and the promise. So we're talking about um, the data gap, um, but also if we look at some of the interventions that governments and say housing providers um, are starting to adopt, they are not fit for purpose for our um, black and um, Asian um, ethnic minority um, voices. So there's been a lot of research done in America, for instance, on the, um, the bias inherent in natural language processing. And um, I've been trying to um, take that research and do the same in the UK. And from what I can gather, and this is something that I want to speak to you, Annette, about today, um, um, after hearing your talk today, is that um, the data sets that are there, that they're training these um, natural language processing voice bots and you know the um, speech analytics pro, um, um, technology, the, the, the data sets they're training them on, don't work for Afro-Caribbean, they don't work for Bangladeshi, and they just don't work. So if we're rushing towards these phone systems, what are we going to end up with? We're just going to further displace um, this, um, these groups who are already multiply disadvantaged. But by the same token, I think it can be the promise. I think that if we can spend the time and, you know, um, Annette, what you were saying there is to do that research, is to create that data set with the diverse voices, not the standard people who are creating this stuff with all of their bias. We need to take it to our own people and create these data sets and then train these algorithms based on that then we can create something really special that's not made for um, middle-class America, which all of the um, main um, five providers of this voice technology is. So for instance, you've got um, Cortana and um, Watson and Alexis and all of those. And the researchers say that even in America, they only really work um, very well for a certain it's mostly a male as well it misunderstands a lot of what women say and i think at the moment it's got worse over covid because you've got more men at home and the algorithm is training itself but um that it misunderstands that this is in america that it misunderstands 35 percent of what all black people say which is just ridiculous so what am i doing about it so i'll tell you a little bit about the very diverse portfolio that uh, all um, kind of works towards trying to solve some of these problems. So the HeroWorks Institute, um, we are a training and um, I guess um, innovation consultancy and we are working with um, mostly unemployed women trying to help them to um, transition into tech. So we're a collaborative trainer and work with um, the Africa Pot and um, Tech Manchester, which is a nonprofit. And so far we've taken 27 women through 
um, a 12 week course to turn them into junior um, ad administrators and they're working on cloud technology and infrastructure and actually we've got somebody on the call today so Jamie hi um, and the idea is that they come through that the other end fully funded as well fully they come through that the other end ready um, for a junior admin position um, but those, those some of those women that are on there um, will also be, um, you know, that's the very beginning of that education process, but they'll also be really interested in some of the programs that you're doing and vice versa. So um, certainly some opportunities to collaborate there. Um, one of the other programs that we are, um, that I'm involved in designing is with the University of Chester. So they are creating a new um, master's, which is a conversion degree um, for, and we want 80% women, um, and all the intersectional um, kind of um, elements to that as well. But 80% women um, is funded by the University of, sorry, it's funded by the Institute of Coding as well. And um, that's going to be available um, to be, um, it will be eligible under the apprenticeship levy as well. So if you're in an, if you're in an employed position, you'll be able to get um, this fully funded. So this will be a master's in data science and AI machine learning. And then there's a, um, a, an apprenticeship, sorry, a, an entrepreneur's um, pathway as well. And so also um, I um, work with the landing and I'm the innovation um, lead for GCHQ. And we have a number of programs as well, fully funded. So um, we've just launched, um, literally just launched um, something called an innovation collab, which is for data science and AI um, entrepreneurs um, to come through. And when we take them through, um, and Annette actually is one of the delivery partners on this. And hence we were talking about um, Annette today and uh, she's made an incredible impression on all of the people at GCHQ. Um, but um, that's a fantastic program, fully funded. So you would be taking startups all the way through so that they can um, develop their product and they get feedback and they also get mentoring from GCHQ um, engineers, which is incredible. Um, we also have a fully funded um, fellowship program, which um, is 75,000 offended for any um, PhD um, sort of research and this call has been closed, but I'm going to be running another few of those as well. Um, so we were looking at um, deep fakes in AI on that one and, and also anything to do with um, security and resilience. Um, and, um, and then Alma is the, um, I guess you could call her Alexa for ha housing. Um, and what we're trying to do there is really take that slice of um, black and Asian, um, you know, uh, accents and um, lexicon and, um, and sentiment and turn a um, and, and create a data set which actually then understands and responds to and respects the ethnic voice um, and then to turn that into a contact um, center bot that helps um, housing providers and um, uh, advise um, so sort of housing advice um, providers to um, help people in need of housing and support um, to access that information. And then also a tenant engagement platform, which will be a platform where we want to um, help them to access incredible programs like yours, Annette, and you know, like the Tech Equity Program, so that we can help people to sustain their tenancies within the social housing sector. So yeah, that's, um, I guess, it. Um, the, all of these are, um, you know, contact me, as I say, a lot of these programs are fully funded. We're also just actually one thing, we're in the, min, in the, um, in the midst of creating a, um, a female tech founders funded program with GCHQ as well. And um, yeah, so that will be something that will be um, rolling out soon. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that, might be it. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Can we give uh, Natalie a 
virtual round of applause. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm always amazed with how much you're doing at any given time. Um, you lead and um, contribute to a lot of really incredible initiatives. So thank you for, for sharing all of those with us. Um, does anybody have any questions for Natalie? I just stunned you all into silence. <laughs> I see Zoe's um, unmuted herself. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I've got a question. So I Natalie, know. I'm particularly interested in stuff about housing in Salford, having previously been a probation officer in Salford and dealing with a lot of people with housing problems in Salford. Um, so, well, two questions. So first of all, you know that the kind of good tenant training, the sort of maintain your tenancy sort of yeah. digital thing. Um, where, where is that being done? Who is that being done for? Which council is it that you're working with? Or Yeah, so we just, that literally, this is my, this is my newborn. So right. um, this is the idea. So the idea is to, um, is to bring, um, bring partners on. So say, for instance, a net program, et cetera, and to, to give them a portal where they can, they can see this, this stuff. So the idea is to start in in somewhere up in the in the northwest, um, and then take that nationally. Um, but yeah, at the moment um, we are looking for partners. Well, it's very interesting. So at the moment, um, in probation, for example, we have providers that provide people who are on probation with with stuff, and some of them they're called CRCs, community rehabilitation companies. And a lot of them um, have been providing good tenant programs and things like that. However, with the COVID um, crisis, um, I know a lot of them have had to basically suspend all of these programs because they hadn't been able to sort of figure out how to do it in a digital way. So I would really encourage you to contact some of the local yeah. rehabilitation companies with this idea um, because it's some because they do take on. Um, sort of suppliers of their of their services um and i mean the local one in manchester uh, in salford the color salford would be cheshire and greater manchester okay. um, CRCs. Uh, oh, that, crcs community rehabilitation companies yeah so this is a problem that's happening right now at the moment um that there are lots of um face-to-face uh, good tenant mm. programs that have just been stopped all around the country um, and then there are, and there are community rehabilitation companies for every sort of part of England and Wales that are that are dealing with it so I think it's like a really um, it's really interesting that you've got that and I would definitely recommend that you contact okay. them well okay and Annette I shall uh, be calling you as well <laughs> Let's 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 um let's approach yeah. that together. I think that would be really great. The other thing that I was going to say as well as a sort of question really is that mm -hmm. the the idea of like of, of of providing digital help through bots and and through these things for people is kind of hampered by the thing that you said at the very beginning, which is a lot of people in deprived um, communities, especially, don't have access to technology. I mean, when I was working in probation, there was a lot of people that were creating apps for offenders. And but most offenders that I work with didn't have smartphones. And if they did, they would sell them pretty quickly. And they'd stick with what we called their sellotape Nokia, which was an old Nokia that was sellotape together. So I guess it's the sort of, yeah. uh, um, do you know what's happening? Yeah. So what's the, what's the, yeah, absolutely. So how do you, how do you, how do you overcome that, um, that digital um, that digital poverty gap. Um, yeah. the, the whole the point is um, is trying to create this voice user um, voice user interface so that you could actually access the information itself just through a voice. So you could phone a number and you could get all of that information just through through voice, and then it could either be posted to you or it could be texted to you or whatever um, to signpost you in. Um, to opportunities in the community. And then looking at things like, um, how do you help someone create or to attend a course if they haven't got a laptop at home? Well, we had this issue with tech equity actually. So when COVID hit, we had to send all of our women home, obviously. Um, we had to pivot very, very quickly to an online course and we'd been doing classroom um, course up to then we actually sent them home with laptops. Now, that is not a scalable option to send, you know, thousands of people laptops. And then even if you did, would they have the, um, 
would they have the Wi-Fi? Um, so the idea is that we create some socially distant centers for them to go yeah. to as well. And then we do blended. But I'm probably taking up too much time, but thank you so much for your questions. Yeah, and true. also that um, that's a great, um, if you could, a little lead for you. <laughs> yes, please. If you could pop that in, and, and me and me and Annette will be all over that. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, um, Zoe and Natalie. Um, I do need to move on to our next speaker, but if anybody else has any more questions for Natalie, feel free to pop them in the chat and maybe she can see them and answer them there. Um, thank you so much again to Natalie. Virtual round of applause. And our next speaker is Professor M. Scaife, if you would like to unmute and share your screen. Okay, I think that's working. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, thank you very much for asking me to, to speak. Um, I feel really not speak after the last two speakers. Um, so um, I'm, I've, I've, I've um, structured this, this um, 15 minutes a bit differently. So it's going to be a bit of a change, but um, there are definitely some common themes actually with the previous two speakers. So um, my um, work is quite different. So I am a, uh, a university professor. I, I work in the Department of Physics at the University of Manchester in the um, astronomy group. Um, so it's part of uh, Jodrell Bank, um, which is part of the University of Manchester. Um, but these days I actually do more computing than astronomy and uh, specifically I work on AI for astronomy. Um, so I was asked to, to talk a bit how, about how I got to where I am. So if you'll... Um, excuse a little bit of a, of a um, this is my life type um, slide. Um, so I am uh, from Manchester. I went to school in Altrincham. Um, and like many um, female academics in physics, I went to an all-girls school. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty common theme. Um, so I, I really had no idea that girls didn't do physics generally this only occurred to me later um, it, well actually no I say I, I take that back actually one of the primary reasons that I went to do physics at university was that I thought that there might be boys there so um, so I must have been aware of it on some level um, and uh, I went to university to do physics pretty much with the view that I'd go into finance afterwards because in my generation of university students that that was what you did if you did physics so I was pretty sure that I was going to do physics and I was going to probably go to London and work in a bank or a management consultancy. And I would estimate that 75% of the people in my academic year at university did that. Um, but I kind of had a, a moment in my, my final year at university where I was um, required to do a research project as part of my degree. Um, and the research project I was given um, was to basically make a radio telescope work. And this was the, the first time I'd really encountered a, a, a telescope of any kind. Um, it looked like this. Um, and it was on the roof of the physics department in Bristol. Um, and it was, it was pretty grotty. I spent a lot of the year up a ladder on this roof in high winds trying to, to make bits of this telescope work, which in retrospect, considering <laughs> considering that I now supervise these kinds of projects, I would be terrified to ask a student to do. Um, so yeah, so this was the, this was the point where um, I basically for forgot about going into the city and, and decided that this was quite good of fun. Um, and, and part of the reason for that was that thinking about it, this was probably the first time when I wrote a computer program. Um, and I was, I was trying to work out at what point in my life I got my first computer. And I don't think I had, a, so we certainly didn't have a computer at home. My parents didn't have a computer. And I don't really remember having my own computer. I didn't have a desktop. I don't really remember having a laptop even as an undergraduate. 
but for the final for this project i sat in a little room which is that room that's sort of in the middle of the roof there um and wrote computer programs in in visual basic which i don't know if anyone else still uses visual basic but it's uh it's not a great programming language though i didn't know that at the time um and it was amazing i was amazed that you could you could you could you know move a telescope around without without actually physically moving it just by pushing a button. Um, it didn't always point where we, where we wanted it to go. Um, we, uh, we were successful though. We successfully uh, detected the sun with, uh, with this radio telescope, which was obviously a relief to everyone because you know, we weren't sure if it was there otherwise. Um, but that was really the start of my, my research career and, and so I went and did a, a PhD um, in astronomy. In fact, it was in, it was in cosmology. Um, I applied for five different PhDs. I said that I would do any branch of astronomy apart from cosmology. And then the one PhD I was offered was in cosmology. So I did cosmology. Um, and again, I, I, I arrived at my PhD um, possibly without a laptop. And when I think back about this, I. I don't, maybe it's just maybe it's just me that finds this so amazing. But what we ask of our undergraduates and certainly our postgraduates now at university certainly requires them to have laptop or access to computing, and to be able to do that in their own time and with prior knowledge. Which I guess was I, I, I literally have no idea how I would get through a degree, how I got through a degree without a computer. But obviously things have changed. Um, and when I started my PhD, the first thing my PhD supervisor did was sit me down at my computer, um, which was a, a Sun terminal um, and ran Unix. Um, and I didn't do anything for a week because I didn't know how to use command line. Um, so it took, it took me a while, um, but I, I kind of got used to it. And the reason I look back on this now with surprise when I think about it is that, is that pretty much everything I do now is computing. So um, when I when I finished my PhD, we were kind of in a um, a golden age for radio astronomy, which is my branch of astronomy, because there are a whole load of new radio telescopes being built all over the world, and so there was a great need for people who knew how to do what I did, um, and specifically to do the computational aspects of it. So I moved more and more towards the the computing side of of research and of astronomy. Um, and these days, I, I sort of, I, I organize computing for research communities in the, not in the sense of um, university IT support, but in the, in the sense of national e-infrastructure provision type thing. Um, but for a long time, it's, it's actually been quite clear to me that the, the most interesting part of um, of computing these days is well for me at least is is AI um, and so I moved more and more towards that side of things which was a natural progression because astronomy is a data-driven science um, and uh, and that's that's where I am today and um, and the the branch of AI that I actually work in um, is is bias so <laughs> So the, so the previous two speakers really set me up quite well for this. Um, so Annette said, you know, what we don't know can hurt us, and I completely agree. So all of that missing data um, that isn't informing the algorithms that increasingly control our lives really can hurt us. Um, and underrepresented communities are hurt most of all. Um, and you know, we, we see the effect of this in headlines, like all of these, um, and we experience it in our daily life. Um, but the kind of bias that I'm most worried about is the bias that we haven't found yet. Um, so the, the unknown unknowns, as Natalie put it. Um, and so how we, how we address this kind of bias in terms of these algorithms, because the algorithms aren't going to go away, is my, my feeling that 
we are now in this, this data-driven economic age. And so really we need to be on top of it rather than trying to get rid of it, I think. So there are, there are different reasons for bias. One of them is, is lack of data. So um, lack of data is, is all over social use of data. Um, and specifically lack of data in, in, in you know, underrepresented areas. Um, and really anytime, anytime you have an algorithm deciding anything for you, you should assume that it's written by a mid twenties to mid thirties white male. Because, because in terms of the sector, statistically that's who it will have been written by and it's who it will have been checked by and it's who it will have been marketed by. So um, this kind of bias is, is all around us. So the work that I do um, because I'm an astronomer, I don't address societal problems when I look at AI, but I do look at how you identify and how you mitigate against AI. So that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, so in terms, of, in terms of the kind of data that I look at, it, it generally starts off a bit like this. So this is um, an image of the radio sky made with the Meerkat telescope in South Africa. Um, and I don't, expect, I don't expect people to look at this and, and know what they're looking at, but basically, to put, it, to put it quite bluntly, every bright spot you see in this image is a supermassive black hole. That's, that's what you're looking at. So in this image, there are a few hundreds. This was a, a first look image. In the kinds of survey data that we get of the sky these days, there are thousands to millions of these objects. And most of astronomy research depends on putting together statistical samples of these different types of objects and then analyzing those statistical samples to do population analysis. Um, and the reason that those samples are interesting is because not, not all black holes are equal, right? So some of, these, some of these bright spots are different to the other bright spots. And if you took a radio astronomer and you zoomed in on some of them, you can see that they're not, they're not all single dots, right? Some of them are double, some of them have little extensions, some of them have a bit of structure. And if we improve the resolution, you'd see even more of that in this image. So if I took a radio astronomer and I pulled out one of these structures, maybe this one, um, they'd look at this and they'd tell you that this is a fanaroff riley class one radio galaxy. Okay. If I pulled out this one, they'd look at it and say, that's a fanaroff riley class two radio galaxy and so on and so forth. So, you know, you can think of them as uh, supermassive black hole galaxy type A and supermassive black hole galaxy type B. Um, and when you've got a survey of the sky that contains thousands of them or millions of them, then you're not going to sit an astronomer down and make them look at each one of them and say, this is a type A galaxy, this is a type B galaxy, put it in that catalog, put it in this catalog and then go away and do your analysis, you run a big AI algorithm over the survey and it goes away and it tells you what kind of galaxies you have and where they are and where they are. And um, the issue with this in terms of the science that you then do with those samples of galaxies is that exactly the same kinds of biases that you see in social algorithms exist in the AI that's applied to extract these galaxies from this, this data. Um, so my work is around how you, how you identify and how you quantify um, the certainty with which you're identifying things in the images. So for my purposes, I work primarily with neural networks. Um, so here's my, my diagram of neural network. And the basic idea for astronomy classification is that I put in my, my image of a galaxy and then my neural network tells me what kind of galaxy it is. So this is, a, this is an example that I think is actually more confusing to, to demonstrate with galaxies. So I've, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, demonstrate it with a cat picture, which as far as I can tell is actually what, you know, the majority of AI on Earth is actually used for classifying. Um, so say you have a picture of a cat, Google image search or Google, and you upload it somewhere. 
Google or Facebook or whatever will be running an algorithm that says, hmm, there is a 90% probability that this is a cat and only a 10% probability that this is a dog. And so when you then search cat pictures on Google, it will bring up this image. Right. Um, now, the problem with this in terms of, of, of understanding the biases and the certainties with which that image is being used is that that 90% doesn't mean that it's really 90% probable that this is a cat image. What it means is that the machine learning algorithm you've used, a neural network in this case, for that particular neural network, it thinks that this is 90% probable. What it doesn't tell you is how good the neural network is or how good the machine learning classifier is. Um, and if you want to identify biases, you need to know what the, um, how good the network is and where its uncertainties are coming in. So there are, there are two ways that you get uncertainties into, into this kind of machine learning. Um, so for a neural network, the first one of these depends on the actual neurons within the neural network. So neural networks work basically by multiplying the input data by a set of numbers and passing it through the neural network. And the number you multiply it by is the network thinks that that's a perfect number. But in reality, there's going to be a range of numbers for every neuron in a neural network that will work. And how big that range is depends on what you've trained the network on. So if your training data set is not representative of the problem that you really want to address, that leads to uncertainty in the machine learning algorithm. Um, and it's technically it's known as epistemic uncertainty. And it's the, the uncertainty that comes from the model itself. Um, the second kind of uncertainty you get is the, the sort of the noisiness of the input data. So when I say noisiness, it's not really, you know, just noise in the image. It's, it's about how much, how much you could change an image and get the same result. Um, so that, that kind of uncertainty is, is different to the uncertainty in the model, but they both contribute to the uncertainty on the output. So um, most of my work these days is around building machine learning algorithms that estimate both types of uncertainty and then allow us to quantify that for the outputs at the other end. And in particular, to look at how it changes when you throw an image of something that the network has never seen before into the mix. So for astronomy, like a lot of science, the real gold dust from new um, new facilities is going to be in discovering new stuff. And if all of your objects are being classified by machine learning algorithms that only know what you've shown them, how do you identify the new stuff when it's buried in millions of other objects? So preserving that discovery space for science when science is becoming as dominated by, by AI as society is, is, is really the core of my current research. Um, but one of the other things I just wanted to, to finish by, oh, no, actually, I was going to show you. Um, so, <laughs> so to go back to the radio galaxies rather than the cats, this is, this is kind of a picture of my day, if you like. So this is my, this is my, my test set of different radio galaxies. And my algorithm is, is ranking them in terms of the certainty with which they're, they're classified um, for type type one radio galaxies and type two radio galaxies. Um, and really, I think what I just wanted to point out here is that the, the stuff at the top has lower uncertainty. So it's, it's pretty much, it's classified correctly and there's no bias in its classification, um, which is nice. And then the stuff at the bottom may or may not be classified correctly. And there's likely to be some bias inherent in the classifications. Um, but the interesting thing about ranking the, the data like this is that the interesting stuff is always at the bottom. So the interesting stuff is the stuff that has the higher uncertainty. It's the stuff we haven't seen before. It's the stuff that doesn't look like the, the archetypal example. Um, and so that's, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm doing this work. 
Um, but yeah, I wanted to finish by, by talking a bit about um, a programme that, that I run and I've been running for the last three years, which also is along the lines of the last, the last two speakers' points. So the telescope that I use and that I showed you the image from is not in the UK. Um, it's being built in South Africa. Um, and it's built by a consortium of com countries that includes eight other African countries outside South Africa. Um, and one of the, so one of the structural inequalities in academic research that requires large facilities is that often those facilities are built in places where there is not a research community that can actually use them themselves. Um, and so we've been, I would say, trying to address this, trying to address this in a limited sense because, you know, it's a, it's a huge issue, especially across multiple countries. And so um, we run a programme um, called Dara Big Data, um, which is co-funded by the UK government's Newton Fund and the um, National Research Foundation in South Africa. Um, to run big data schools and um, sort of a more didactic type of hackathon, um, which um, are open to students from all of those countries. So the, the big picture here is from our last big school, um, which is the Big Data Africa School. So we ran this about this time last year. We should be running this year's one around now, but obviously it's not happening. Um, so we, structure these schools around project-based um, working. So the groups are split up. Um, and this year it has been really good because it's the, we've been running them for, for several years now. And this is the first year that our own students have become the project leaders for the different projects, um, which is really nice and, and really important. Um, so again, um, when Annette was talking about mentors, she was mentioning that you need to you need to be able to see yourself in the people who are running the projects for you. So this is really um, something that we've had to be quite careful of. One of the issue, one of the reasons why we've been running this as a, a UK project is that in the data intensive research areas, there aren't enough people qualified at PhD level to run these workshops within the countries themselves. So we're supporting the communities there by by running them and creating the projects and stuff but at, at some point you know it's you're just another european white woman heading down to africa to do good so it's um we have to be very careful to make sure that um really the the workshops are focusing on the students and that the students really have that pull through so we get that that sort of uh pipeline of development um, which I have to say has not has not been difficult to implement because there's a great sense of um, community responsibility um, amongst our students, which is which has helped us a huge amount. Um, so yeah, so I, I um, I'll I'll end there. Um, Natalie had a way better slide than than I did, <laughs> but um, yeah, happy birthday, Her Plus Data Manchester. Thank you, Anna. Virtual round of applause. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for speaking. I've yeah been wanting to get you to speak for a long time now. Uh, like I said, Anna um, really helped um, uh, empower us in the in well for most of her plus data, anyways, for all of it. Um, and she funded our, our meetup group for a long time. So thank you so much for all of your support um, and for speaking to us tonight. Uh, we have time for one or two quick questions, if anybody has any. Nobody's got a question. Can I just say how awesome that was? I mean, like, <laughs> my new superhero. That was just like, <laughs> he took the most complicated and complex thing and just broke it down so it seemed so simple. And that is not an easy thing to do. So just yeah. thank you. That was amazing. And yeah. well done all the work you're doing as well. Oh, just uh, no, absolutely. I think there's a mutual appreciation society here, definitely performing. Um, amazing, amazing. So many different perspectives. In your perspective, I've never seen before either. 
learning so much. So can I just ask a quick question about, um, are any of those um, students then becoming um, interested in the work and are they going on to continue this? Yeah, so, um, so we, we fund graduate, so MSc and PhD students um, from, the, uh, from eight different countries to come and do their graduate degree in the UK. Um, and we do, they work in astronomy, health data, and agriculture data, mainly earth observation for agriculture. Um, and they're just starting to graduate now because the PhDs take a while. But yeah, the PhDs are certainly staying in research and the MSCs are going into PhDs. Um, most of our students um, want to go back to their home country, which... Um, is understandable it's quite difficult um because you know you're when you are the the first person in a research area how do you get started so um at the moment we're looking at how we extend that pipeline to give them the support that they need back home as well mm. um two of our two of the so i should say there's also an associated sister program um that only looks at astronomy but they've also started graduating their PhD students. And um, so two of our PhDs are now working as postgraduate researchers in the UK, um, which is really nice. Um, although, so a, a friend of mine pointed out to me something that I've been worried about for a while and she just crystallized it for me quite recently, which is that in astronomy, there are five black professional astronomers in the UK in research and none of them are British. If that, so wow. uh, yeah. Um, so the, so although, yeah, our programs are, um, are supporting, you know, generally black astronomy, but with not within the UK, which is a, a, a worry that I'm very aware of. Amazing work though, amazing work. Thank you so much. Can we, can we give Anna another virtual round of applause? Thank you so much. And um, now we'll move on to our final speaker, uh, Maruna. Very excited um, to hear your talk. She's an intern at Palo Soto, who we've had many in-person events with, um, and we might have had an event there tonight, but here we are online. So if you would like to unmute and share your screen, if you have slides, or if not, yes. that's okay too. Thank you, Rachel. I'll just share my screen. Oh, unfortunately, I think. Oh, I have to make you a co-host again. Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, that's my. I thought. had some difficult issues. But... Okay, you should hopefully have that option now. Yes. Great. Hey. Let me know if you can see the screen. Not yet. <laughs> oh. oh, I can't believe I'm having technical issues again. <laughs> it's not a tech event unless there are tech issues. Normally it's me. <laughs> this is pretty bad. Mm, let me try a different method. Okay. Ah, that looks Do you like see now? Yep, yep, perfect. Great, amazing. So we'll just make this small. Um, so this is me. Uh, as Rachel said, my name is Marina Tekshano. I'm an NLP data science uh, at Hello Soda, where I did my placement here and also worked uh, part time before. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation or if there is anything that you didn't get a chance to ask by the end of it, feel free to connect with me uh, through the following social media platforms. Um, I'm most active on LinkedIn, but also have a Twitter account. So feel free to reach out and connect with me. 
Um, I am, as I said, an NLP data scientist. So at Hello Soda, my main job is to develop and design uh, natural language uh, products that gain customer insight from social media data um, and also enhance and rebuild a few other models from our ecosystem. So before diving in, this is not as flashy, but I would like to thank everyone for being here, for having me tonight, and wish everyone a happy third birthday uh, since joining Herplus Data over a bit over a year ago. I gained so, so much from meeting like-minded data ladies, uh, hearing just extremely empowering stories and hearing all your journeys, getting real life advice. And everything has helped me both on a professional and personal level. So a big thank you to everyone for making this real and for being awesome. So a bit about the talk today. Uh, I will go through three major things, uh, my career journey and how I started with data science and NLP, a few cool projects that I worked on uh, throughout the year, and 10 actionable tips uh, for you to actually uh, go and experiment with NLP, uh, for you to feel a bit more confident uh, to explore the field uh, and hopefully learn a bit by the end of this presentation about what NLP is about and what it really involves. So first thing, my career journey. Um, I started working at Hello Soda a bit uh, over a year ago, um, working as a part-time uh, intern for my probation uh, during my third year at the University of Manchester. So I've been uh, studying at the University of Manchester as a computer uh, science student with artificial intelligence. Then uh, for my placement year, I've done my placement year at Hello Soda uh, as a full-time intern. Um, and this year I continue with Hello Soda, working at Hello Soda and also finishing my uh, master's uh, degree at the University of Manchester. Um, my my part-time journey uh, started uh, in an unexpected way. Um, I met my manager at a meetup, just like this. Um, so I, I had a chat with her and was really, really excited to learn more about data science. I had no background and no experience whatsoever. Um, and after discussing a bit about my projects at university, I interviewed and got the job uh, at uh, during my part-time period, I um, worked a bit in Python. I gained hands-on experience with pandas and numpy arrays and really added bits and pieces to various uh, models, um, which gave me the, a solid foundation for later on building on. As uh, I will show you in a second, a few projects, my um, responsibilities evolved over the year. So from uh, moving on from part-time to full-time, I started enhancing models, adding, adding multilingual extensions, also building end-to-end -end, uh, classifiers, um, working on uh, projects that detect various interests, uh, keyword in, of keywords of interest in social media data. And it was all cool and fun. Uh, so I will share a bit with you now what this, this uh, looked like really and how uh, from there I moved on to actually uh, be in charge of managing all NLP models at the company uh, and also working with the engineering team on uh, integrating the solutions into the production uh, system and uh, also enhancing uh, existing models. So due diligence uh, was a cool project that allow, uh, allowed business uh, clients to detect various slang words and uh, negative expressions in text data. So in the, um, in the posts that 
were self-disclosed by uh, users. Uh, it also returns a confidence score for the membership. So whether or not and how confident we are that in, this, in the given sentence, a word is indeed uh, negative. Um, the, the simplest way to really do this is by just having a list of keywords and searching for them in um, posts, but this is not necessarily a good uh, means of doing it. Uh, for instance, if you see uh, these two examples, uh, let's say we detect the word terrible in a sentence, uh, but the sentence actually has a good, a positive note to it because the person uh, really liked the movie, whereas other people didn't. Um, and on the other hand, stuff like uh, negations uh, are not uh, detected if we just follow this approach. So in the sentence, I was, it wasn't that bad. Uh, this would be uh, negatively uh, marked. So what my job was in this case was to find a way to improve uh, the detection process. So a good, a good thing to do is to start uh, adding features that look at the context, look at how uh, words are um, placed within a sentence, um, and also keep in mind uh, the polarity or the sentiment, whether the user uh, talks in a positive manner or negative, uh, and all, use all these small features to increase um, the likelihood that your uh, score and your result is actually uh, good. Another cool project was uh, building a big five personality predictor. So a model that uh, based on psycholinguistic features uh, predicts uh, from the language of the user how open or uh, neurotic someone might be. So these uh, are the five um, personalities that are computed. Um, and how this has been done was by analyzing uh, social media footprints, so data, be it from Twitter or Facebook, um, extracting uh, and tokens specific to, re related to uh, these uh, psychological uh, dimensions, uh, producing scores, uh, which will then be used in aiding, uh, he helping businesses uh, choose better uh, in, in decision making. Um, and what my second task for this project was, uh, was to also build a Thai uh, extension for the model. So the model would be able to detect uh, multilingual terms in both English and Thai, uh, thus be used by people um, of different uh, ethnicities. Uh, and that was one of the, the big tasks that I was uh, assigned to and looked into applying to other projects as well. Uh, the third one being, in my opinion, the one I had most fun with and that was the most impactful, an interest classifier that was specifically built for uh, Thai language. So what this interest classifier did was to detect um, detailed user interests uh, using some matched keywords. Um, so it was a hybrid method, uh, a hybrid model using both rule-based and machine learning methods to predict uh, the classes of interests from user posts. Uh, it was very fine grained. So uh, for instance, if you look, if you have an interest in sports and you talk about sports, you can detect down to um, team names, down to uh, very specific clubs of, of football, for instance. So it was very nice, uh, this separation as being very detailed. Um, what the challenges, the biggest challenges when uh, working with Thai, uh, the Thai language and other languages in general 
is that um, it is fairly, fairly difficult uh, to create a solution that gives us good results as English does. And that is mainly because of all the resources available for English. Uh, Thai language doesn't have as many resources out there. Um, so not as many people have been working with it. And even the, the most the state of the art methods don't give that high of an accuracy. So two examples here are uh, the same sentence in English and Thai. So in English, no Sunday afternoon without pizza, Dungeons and Dragons and the best Miles Davis tunes. So the interest uh, interests detected here, pizza, uh, food, Dungeons and Dragons games and Miles Davis music would be detected in a Thai post. Uh, here, Miles Davis, which kept the same, same name, so same representation. Uh, this is the word for pizza and this is the word for Dungeons and Dragons. But that is an ideal case where you really match what you, you expect. But in reality, uh, Thai introduces lexical ambiguity um, because Thai as a language doesn't use any punctuation signs or spaces. Spaces normally represent uh, pauses in speech. So it is much harder to define word boundaries or simply detect a string that you uh, are looking for. So in this situation, to really detect something um, in an accurate way uh, without taking too long, because of course clients are interested in having it, having a fast and reliable method, um, I had to change a bit the matching algorithm. So normally, as I said, state of the art uh, models would be the best solution. They don't really give as accurate results as English, but would still be the best solution. So what I did in this case was to combine a good tokenizer for Thai with a um, se sequence of character approach where based on the context, so uh, the sequences following and preceding the words, uh, the algorithm would detect whether or not uh, what you are trying to match, so this sequence of four, four uh, letters, for instance, is really a, a word or in this uh, big sentence or whether or not it is just a sub, substring or subcomponent of some other word. So that's one of the challenges that I run into and something that was very, very interesting to work with. Um, now for tips, I would like to share with you some tips uh, for you to uh, be able to take with you uh, after this meeting and hopefully apply. Uh, the first one being that when starting with NLP, the most important thing, no matter what you know or what you don't, is to understand the basic terminology. So, Words such as tokenization, corpus, stop words, or stemming, you don't really need to know everything to begin with, but these would give you the basic, uh, basic tools to actually understand um, when reading papers or reading articles, what those articles um, mean, and also understand what you work with. Also, finding a project of interest that is uh, on top of the list, because whenever you begin your journey in a different field, that should interest you in some way for you to be passionate about and love to, to learn about it. So finding a project of interest or something that you, you like is really important. Also, starting small, um, there is no need to build the next most complex um, algorithm or project. But by starting small and understanding really what you do uh, and finding a project such as for language generation, 
or language modeling generating song lyrics. So if you have a favorite artist trying to generate something, uh, some text that is um, in the same style, or like the Harry Potter book uh, generation was, I think a few years ago, um, someone tried to write another Harry Potter book using uh, data and text from the original books. Um, for question answering, chatbots are really, uh, really cool. Uh, you can build, for instance, a stoic chatbot. You ask some questions and uh, the, the responses that uh, this chatbot answers with could be in a stoic style. Or you could also connect databases to this one if it's uh, if you have, of course, approval of the user uh, to enrich uh, this. Or another example I wanted to give you is picking a friend's gift with sentiment analysis. So uh, analyzing text to build something cool and applicable. Uh, and really for this one, there is no limit. There are so many applications to natural language processing understanding and generation, you can do anything. Um, the third tip is to keep the big question in mind. So as for any data science project, it's really important to know what you are trying to solve because it is so easy to start asking more and more questions. And that is of course uh, natural, but you should always, always keep in mind the big question. And also keep in mind what your, uh, the requirements are for your project, um, because uh, this was something I personally run into, uh, finding options and options for um, going, getting to an answer, um, and a lot of cool features, but you should always keep on the essentials first. You should always focus on the essentials and keep the optionals for later on, maybe as uh, future uh, features uh, and just stream them uh, in the start. Uh, the fourth tip is to not depend on tutorials. And this is specifically uh, not falling in a tutorial loop where you might read uh, many articles uh, that don't necessarily uh, have a solution for your specific problem. So tutorials are very good uh, way uh, and a very good mean of expanding your knowledge, especially if there are tutorials from um, websites with official documentation like uh, Scikit-Learn or TensorFlow. They have many good tutorials, uh, but you should always take uh, any kind of tutorial with a grain of salt and try to only incorporate them in what you know so far and yet get your hands dirty with code. Um, so that's, that's what this tip is really about. Don't fall in the tutorial uh, loop and don't get a false idea of learning by using tutorials. Uh, understand the language rules. So for instance, and specifically for, for multilingual projects, it is very, very important to understand the syntax of the language. Uh, because as shown for Thai, languages have different rules and many programs are built um, with English in mind. Uh, but when it comes to Thai or German, for instance, that uh, has a lot of lexical information in uh, capital letters um, or Chinese, uh, you cannot really treat the languages in the same way. So you should do a bit of homework before figuring out um, what kind of challenges you might have and what uh, ambiguities there might be and what the problems you might run into are. Um, also something that would be very helpful is getting help from native, native speakers. So if you know anyone that speaks the language or if you have access to anyone to just uh, ask them for help whenever you uh, are trying to uh, figure if something is correct or not. And also using forums 
even though these forms might be in the language, uh, in the target language, using Google Translate can be very useful. Uh, and just doing, doing this and trying to get um, help and understand uh, what to work with and how to design the language rules for pre-processing is very, very, very important. Uh, the sixth rule is knowing your data. And by knowing your data, what I mean is understanding the format and the, uh, the content of the files you're working with and also the granularity. And I will give you an example um, from my experience when I first started working with Thai language. Uh, I had on my hands a set of files uh, that I knew contained words. Uh, and because Thai doesn't have, as English has, spaces to uh, separate words, I took them as they were. I assumed they were correct and started working with them as they were to detect uh, keywords in text. But what I, uh, to my, uh, unfortunately, what I discovered uh, a few weeks later was that my program, which was designed to detect uh, keywords, actually was trying to detect in over 60% of the time sentences, as those files also contain sentences and definitions, which would never be detected. So that is that was something uh, I, I found uh, out and was very disappointed. Um, and from then on, I remember it every single time to actually check uh, and challenge my assumptions with regards to whatever data you have. Um, and especially for something you're not entirely familiar with, try and uh, figure if your assumptions are actually correct or not. So that is uh, the sixth tip. Uh, the seventh tip is that NLP is iterative. Uh, so the more features you have and the more features you want to add to your model, the longer time it is going to take. Um, the best thing is to start small and take small steps uh, and not necessarily uh, building complex solutions that do a lot of things from the beginning because uh, that is not really a good thing to do. Uh, and especially for NLP, as there are so many techniques, uh, deep learning and machine learning, if you have available data, it's so easy to just jump right into those, try to build something uh, nice and flashy, but really you should focus on the things that are of best use to your problem. In many cases, even rule-based uh, approaches are good and give good results for your projects. Uh, and also uh, taking the time to test everything uh, and iterate. So as you iterate and as you spend more time and test and compare your versions, you can reach uh, some very good versions, but always start, start small and don't uh, optimize too early on. And also stay ambitious. Just because you start small, that doesn't mean you cannot uh, build or use something uh, more recent. Uh, the A tip is to reach out. Uh, reach out whenever you have a problem or a question. There are so many people out there. The community is so uh, large and so friendly. Uh, and if you have a question, it's very likely that someone else has had the same question as you did. Uh, so don't be afraid to ask. There are many resources. Uh, the most important thing is to not be alone and not struggle for a long time, but rather try to find the answer somehow. And even if you don't find the answer, the specific answer for the question you're looking for, finding some guidance and some tips that will help you get there. The ninth step uh, to take your time um, it's very important to build a good foundation from the start. Otherwise, uh, your base it will be very shaky. Uh, and build on that, break things down and try to understand uh, everything, but also keep in mind where you want, to, you, you want to go and celebrate your small wins because that is really what 
makes things exciting. Just acknowledging the fact that you are making progress, even though it doesn't feel like it, you are making progress. Um, and take things one at a time. And the last step, but not the least important, is to be curious and passionate about what you do. NLP is exciting and the language is exciting. It is always changing. There are always new things you can explore and language is everywhere. And if you, until now, only thought about uh, the English language, there are so many uh, dimensions in uh, multilingual uh, models and things to explore in those fields as well. So take your time uh, and be curious and explore. Uh, feel, uh, try to remember uh, why you are uh, working with data and why, like, what your what your drive is really. Uh, and know that no matter where you are now, uh, in time you will, uh, you could reach anywhere, and your drive will take you there. Um, and that is the end of my uh, presentation. I had a really good time just chatting with you today and I hope you uh, enjoyed this. Awesome, thank you so much Maruna. We all have a virtual round of applause. Um, that was amazing, thank you so much. Uh, we have time for one quick question if anybody has one. Is anybody else working on natural language processing? I was gonna say, I remember we had a chat about this, Natalie. I, are you taking notes? <laughs> Furiously, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was there was a lot of um, really great actionable insight and tips there. Um, so um, my question is: um, trying to build a, I guess, um, a model that understands diverse accents as well as language. Um, have you any sort of tips on, you know, techniques around that? Uh, yes, so this is a big, a big problem in the space, uh, and that is mainly uh, because of the issue of gathering data and how you can collect the data. Uh, getting the data to actually start modeling and build something is the most important step, uh, because without enough resources uh, that could could exemplify how someone speaks with a certain accent or someone uses some cer certain words uh, the model cannot learn that easily uh, unless you, you either collect or either uh, source them somehow um, and that, that is for the the dialect but it's definitely something that can be achieved it's just it just it's just a matter of time and a matter of data collection um, and for the, for the language step, if that is something that is to be done in a language that is different than English, um, getting help from someone that is native, that would understand, uh, is the most straightforward thing to do. Uh, for instance, in my Thai project, I had a chance to work with a native and that was working at the same, in the same company as, as us. And it was very, very helpful, mainly because there are so many things that unless you, you live and speak the language for uh, a matter of years or decades, you cannot really catch. Uh, it, and with dialects, it's a thing of subtlety. Mm -hmm. So it would be something that would be ben beneficial. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and I just want to reiterate that a lot of those actionable tips you gave um, are really useful for a lot of areas of, of data science. So thank you for so much for sharing this. Um, I think we'll wrap it up there. We'll give one last round of applause to all of our speakers. Thank you so much for coming and inspiring us tonight um, and for sharing your journeys and your insights, new projects with us. Um, I've shared loads of links in the chat and tweeted some as well. So hopefully you'll find everything um, that everybody talked about today, but if not, feel free to um, get in touch. 
Um, but thank you so much again for coming to celebrate with us tonight. I know it's late. I know it's hard to be online all day, um, but we really appreciate everybody coming and engaging and, and spending some time together and, and talking data. So have a wonderful evening and hopefully see you next month. Thank you again to all our speakers and to everybody who came. Thank you for having us and lovely to meet you all. Okay, bye. Thanks, Thanks Rachel. Bye. Bye.